I uh, appreciate everyone getting on to our call today. Uh, we are, we've actually been planning this webinar for a couple of months now with ACHC, hoping with the uh, Express Scripts credentialing package that many of you all have received uh, the last quarter of last year to uh, put to rest some of the fears and concerns that you might have with what accreditation is all about. Um, so what we have done is uh, uh, Greg Stoll with uh, ACHC will be presenting first and he will be answering hopefully a lot of the uh, questions and uncertainties you might have regarding the accreditation process that their organization does on your behalf. And then at the end, we will have uh, BioPlus, Dr. Morales speak uh, from BioPlus, uh, who has been through this process, followed by uh, me presenting on the tools that are available on the COPA website and helping you to achieve the ACHC accreditation. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Greg. And as I said, he is in charge of the education and consulting as a manager for ACHC and has worked with us from the very beginning, uh, starting with our ACHC board, uh, when with the pharmacists that sit on that board, uh, when we originally started working through this process, he came out and did a presentation, all day presentation for us. And as you will hear from him today, there, there are other opportunities that you have through uh, edu be becoming educated on this process that he will discuss later that are more in length than what he will discuss today. So thank you, Greg, for joining us. Well, thank you, Ricky. We appreciate the opportunity to <clears throat> come and present to your group today. Thank you for all those that have bared with us as we work through the technology. We're going to do everything we can to try to answer uh, as many questions as we can in a, in a brief amount of time. Obviously, our focus of this time together is looking at specialty pharmacy accreditation, including ACHC's oncology distinction program. Our learning objectives over this next uh, hour or so is going to be to introduce uh, ACHC and what, we, uh, what programs we offer, uh, review our pharmacy accreditation program, establish expectations for your survey process and strategies for that survey day success, uh, review our distinction in oncology standards, and then, of course, a Q&A with an organization that has already successfully navigated this process, BioPlus Specialty Pharmacy, who is also on the line today and going to be sharing their experiences with us as well. I start off with our missions because this is what you can expect as you partner with ACHC in getting accredited. You can expect our organization to operate with the mission and the values that you see here, uh, and we're committed to collaborative relationships with the organizations that we accredit. We believe in flexibility, but no compromising of the quality of the care that's being provided, that every one of our employees is accountable for their contribution, and that we will conduct ourselves always in an ethical manner. This is critical because as you have our surveyors on site, you need to know what we are as an organization and what values we are holding ourselves and our staff to. You'll see here listed the programs that we offer. Obviously, our focus today is on the narrow group there in the middle for pharmacy, but know that organizations that are looking at who they will accept from an accreditation perspective, this list is very important to them, and, and uh, we're very proud of the fact that we have gained uh, CMS acceptance and acceptance across a very broad spectrum of payers for all of the programs you see listed. Of course, the accredited locations uh, you will see listed here. Now, these do cover all of our programs, but there are now over 15,000 accredited locations, and uh, we are going to be uh, pleased to extend that to many of you that are on the phone to be a part of the ACHC family at the end of this journey that you'll be on to get accredited. <clears throat> I head up a division called Accreditation University, still part of ACHC, but it gives us the opportunity. Uh, Ricky's going to talk to you at the end about many tools that are available through COPA, which we're very excited to have partnered with them on. If you need more help, if you need more uh, hands-on, even on-site type of assistance, just know that ACAC and Accreditation University can help fill those gaps for you with many different types of services, and we would be happy to discuss those with you. Of course, who credits the accreditor is a question that we get asked a lot. We are an ISO certified organization. And I'll draw your attention primarily to the middle of this screen that talks about the um, 
uh, a principal requirement of our quality management system is that we meet customer statutory and regulatory requirements. And that's ultimately why you are also seeking accreditation is so that you can meet those regulatory requirements that are being imposed on you by payers. We subject ourselves to this type of inspection every year and it makes us a better company and make sure that uh, we are also living by the same high standards that we expect of our accredited organizations. So customer satisfaction is important to us. Uh, I would tell you that every customer that goes through accreditation with us, uh, BioPlus can certainly tell you this from their experience. We want to know how we did and we have set a very high standard for ourselves to make sure that not only do we provide a quality accreditation, but that we provide it in a way to where our customers feel like that they got value for the investment that they have made in this process. So we take great pride in this and we are, are pleased to be able to offer this same great customer service to each one of you. As we now get into the specifics of our pharmacy accreditation, you'll see in the blue box on the screen the, the different pharmacy programs that we uh, are accrediting. And we often get asked, why so many programs? Well, really, it's a we're trying to tailor these requirements to what an organization really does. We're also trying to reduce confusion. It's very difficult to comply with a requirement when it doesn't really fit what you as an organization do. So as we look in the box, you'll see over there that there's specialty pharmacy, specialty pharmacy without demi post, meaning you're not gonna provide any Medicare Part B demi post products. You, of course, see our distinction programs there, oncology being the one that we're talking about today. These programs really have their own standards because we want them to be relevant to what you do as a practitioner, but also we want them to be uh, a part of uh, what you do in uh, the provision of, of care and service. You'll see here listed our distinction programs, distinction in oncology, uh, in infectious disease. Uh, you'll also see now that we are offering a specialty pharmacy accreditation that is uh, without demi post and uh, we can talk more about that when we get to it. Next, Ricky, if you can. ACHE partnered with COPA to develop uh, an accreditation program for oncology. This really elevates current specialty pharmacy accreditation requirements that have been a part of the ACHC family for a long time. This also includes standards uh, in addition to those current specialty pharmacy requirements that focus on the practice of medication therapy management for those oncology patients. We were very proud to partner with COPA in this endeavor, and uh, it has uh, really uh, turned out to be a tremendous product, and we're very excited to bring it to you guys today. So here you'll see listed our oncology uh, distinction, the sections that will be involved in it that we'll cover very briefly today. Once again, we don't have a lot of time to spend on each of these. So this is really the old saying, a 30,000 foot view, but we wanna give you a good umbrella overview of what the process is. We, you see the different sections that we will cover as part of our accreditation survey, organization administration, service operations, fiscal management, HR, provision of care, performance improvement, then of course, risk management. Below that, you will see our specific levels of distinction, the, the standards that were added for the distinction in oncology. Obviously, the delivery of medications for cancer-specific conditions, identification of toxic nature of medications, and integration of physician, pharmacist, and patient to optimize the plan of care, cost, and of course, patient outcomes. Of course, the benefits of oncology distinction produce consistency, measurable outcomes to analyze the treatment and care of this uh, specific healthcare diagnosis to monitor and compare cost-effective care with medication management, which would include complete patient medication profile, ongoing quality management of medication and monitoring of all drug interactions during treatment, and of course, compliance monitoring to confirm proper utilization through clinical guidelines. Of course, the accreditation process uh, really to help you navigate this, I call them coaches, Officially here, we call them our account advisors, but ultimately they are your advocate inside our organization to help you walk through the accreditation process. I think if Ricky and our team here were to help you walk away with anything today, it's that you do not have to go through this process alone. There are people, there are resources that are available to you to help you navigate this accreditation process. For our organization, this account advisor is the one who will be with you from the time that you apply 
all the way through to the successful completion of your accreditation and beyond. They are a key resource for all of us, but especially for you. They help coordinate all of the survey activities. They are not experts uh, from a pharmaceutical perspective. They're not pharmacists, but they're experts on our process. And if they need to get additional help, they will go find that help and and try to make sure that we get you the answers that you need. Uh, the surveyor, who is the surveyor? Obviously an expert in specialty pharmacy. Uh, the average for our surveyors is 20 plus years of experience. They've completed comprehensive training, background checks. They have been precepted in the field. We've done a business associate agreement with all of our surveyors. They've selected on your survey based on their experience and um, they're asked to verify that there's no conflict of interest with the organization that they're going to go survey. You typically will not know the name of your surveyor in advance. There could be some nuances there for large organizations, but generally uh, that would be the expectation. Uh, just as a side note, uh, probably half of our surveyors that you might see are full-time employees of ACHC, and about half are contracted pharmacists, surveyors, who are both still practicing pharmacists, but also commit some of their time to help us uh, in this uh, peer review. So if I was to ask you the single most problematic area in accreditation, and I would tell you that typically this particular issue does impact the rest of your survey, I'm wondering what most of you there would be guessing. But I'll go ahead and tell you right now, it is usually around the topic of personnel orientation, training, and competencies. And it's not that we don't think that these activities happen. In fact, the organizations that we go in usually do a very good job with this. But now you have an outside organization coming in that you now have to prove that these activities happen. Documentation tends to be the big hurdle for most practices to get over. So we'll start off right here by asking on your personnel training, orientation, and competencies, are you effectively documenting those activities so that if I came and did your survey, that you could prove to me for the employee that we're talking about that these activities took place? This is usually one of the first places I would tell everybody when they get off the call, go talk to HR, go look at your own processes and validate, particularly for your clinical staff, could you prove that these activities happened with your staff? Now the survey day, is scheduled based on a number of factors. The primary one that is going to be used is a date of readiness. So when you apply, and our account advisor coach here is gonna walk you through that process, you are given the opportunity to select a date of readiness. It is assumed as of that date that your organization is following all of ACHC's standard requirements as of that date. Now, the date of readiness doesn't mean that we will show up that day or the next day because, in fact, we're looking for evidence of compliance. So if that date was today, which I think we're at the 23rd today, and we were to come a month from now to do your survey, we would be looking back 30 days worth of information back to today to validate compliance. We can't hold you accountable to being compliant with our standards the day before because you established that date of readiness of today. So I hope that that makes sense. So first thing that we'll look at is that date of readiness. Now the surveyor can theoretically show up at any point after that, but usually it is based on a number of other factors. The surveyor can show up during your normal hours of operation. For many of you, this, this may well be an announced survey because you won't be doing Medicare guinea post work. The typical survey is a two day survey usually with one pharmacist doing the survey, and it usually follows whatever your normal business day is, that is the schedule for the surveyor as well. Now, these are the things that are involved in a typical survey, an opening conference where you have an opportunity to set the agenda for the day. You can get your staff in the room. I usually encourage you to bring your staff into the room. You want them to see that I'm not some mean, horrible person that is going to torture them throughout the day. You want a level of feeling that this is going to be a process that they're gonna do well in, and it allows them to, to, for us to show them that this is gonna be a very collaborative experience. We'll tour your facility, we'll do staff interviews, we'll do personnel record reviews, patient record reviews, patient interviews, We'll review any of the appropriate logs if you were a Medicare provider or other documents that would be appropriate 
related to your services. We'll review performance improvement and quality and improvement data, and then we'll do an exit conference at the end of the day, and that exit conference will allow us to really tie a bow around all, the entire day, our findings, and what our recommendations are from uh, our pharmacists that visited you that day. <clears throat> Some tips on that day. I always laugh at the first one uh, because when I had ACHC come survey me, I couldn't do the top one, but try to keep everybody relaxed. Uh, this, this, this is a very collaborative effort. We want this to feel like a peer review. It really is focused that way and we want you to keep your staff relaxed. Your patients come first, so never apologize if someone has to answer the phone or respond to a patient. That is expected and we are clinicians too. We understand that. Perfection is not the goal of the day. So of our 150 plus people that are on the phone today, if you are a perfectionist, accreditation is probably going to drive you a little crazy because you're just not ever going to get there. That is not the goal of this. The goal of this, in my opinion, is for you to be able to successfully pass and get accredited. Perfection does not have to be a part of that. Anything can be fixed. There's really nothing that your staff can say to us that will sink the ship, so relax. It's going to be okay. When we interview them, they're, they're going to be fine. Deficiencies are common and expected. Don't get sidetracked by what's my score. Uh, frankly, no one really knows what the score is, and that's all decided back here at the office. Uh, ask for clarification if there's something that is said that you don't understand, and it's okay to challenge the surveyor. They're not always right, so it's okay to ask questions and to say, I really don't think that you saw that right or understood that right. <clears throat> now, at the end of this time, it is our expectation level that everybody on this call is going to end up in the top tier of this slide. There's really functionally no difference between accredited and accreditation pending. Both have done an exceptional job. Both have performed uh, incredibly well. Both have very few deficiencies. The one difference is on a, a new organization, which most of you on the phone would be that with us, on the accreditation pending, you're not going to get your certificate until you send in your plan of correction addressing your deficiencies. On the accredited one, you get your certificate right away. Now, now both have to send in a plan. Both will have deficiencies, but uh, that's really the only difference. It, and and from, a, from a functional standpoint, the accreditation pending had a few more deficiencies than the company that got accredited immediately. If I was going to give you an idea percentage-wise, uh, I would say probably 70% of our specialty pharmacies, maybe 75% end up in the accreditation pending because there's almost always things to correct. That's expected. You send in the plan of correction, we review that plan and accept that plan and you move on. So the top tier is all good. The bottom tier is not good, and we're just not even going to probably talk about that one very much. So uh, to be dependent, you had to have sufficient enough things that were viewed on site that we just really feel like not only do you need to submit a plan of correction, but we need to come out and resurvey. That does not happen a lot, but it does happen. And even more rare than that would be those that would end up denied that there were just they just were not prepared. Now, I will tell you, this doesn't mean that you are a good practice or anything. That's not what this is about. This is about accreditation is more about documentation and more about can you prove to somebody that was on site uh, activities that took place. <clears throat> so our post-survey process is the, the creation by your organization of a plan of correction. A template is sent to you. Uh, it's an electronic form. You tell us what you're going to fix, how you're going to fix it, and a time frame in which those activities will be completed. That post-survey process gets sent back here. A review committee will look at that. And at that point, uh, if there's a question, they'll send that back to you. But if not, it will be approved. Uh, some things will require evidence. I will tell you most things do not. So if you tell us that you're going to retrain your staff on something that was noted as a deficiency, we're going to probably uh, accept that and then we'll validate that the next time that we come out for your reaccreditation. We do ask that you get that plan of correction back in in a timely manner. I think our policy says 30 days. My recommendation to you would be there is no reason to wait 30 days. Uh, when you get the summary of findings, which is the written documentation of the survey, 
you want to get this filled out and sent in immediately because you want to get yourselves accredited quickly and you're only telling us what the plan is. It doesn't mean that you've had to execute the plan yet. So it says 30 days. I would tell each of you, do not wait when it comes time to submit the plan of correction. Get it in quickly. All right. So let's look at um, some of our particular uh, oncology standards. And once again, this is going to be a very high level view out of respect for time. Uh, we are available here at ACAC in addition to Ricky and his team. If there's any questions that we can answer, we're going to make ourselves available to you. But let's, let's dig in here. You saw that we talked about our different sections. The survey or on survey will address each of these areas with you. Obviously, we are spending more time in the section four, human resources, section five, provision of care, and section uh, seven and eight, uh, dealing with oncology, but we do address all of these sections while we are on um, site. So as we look at our particular uh, oncology standards, I don't have the full standard up on the screen, but just enough to give you an overview of what those standards address. Our first standard, which is DRX 11-A, that you have a PAC, and that the PAC will be uh, representative from the organization comprising professionals with expertise in the treatment of oncology patients. The PAC meet once a year, which obviously um, isn't going to have to, that once a year isn't going to happen. Although we do ask that there is at least one PAC meeting prior to our visit to you for your initial survey. So there's some details in, in 11A, and Ricky's going to talk to you about how to get the standards. They've already got the standards. They can get the full standard to you, but we just wanted to give you a quick look at, at the, the first standard there, which is uh, that you have a PAC. 11B. Hey, we had one question, Greg. We had a question. Uh, how often is reaccreditation? Uh, reaccreditation uh, is going to be every three years. So once the process is completed, uh, the plan of correction is submitted, you get your certificate that is uh, dated on that date, and then the process starts, Ricky, typically about two and a half years later. They're going to get a notice that it's time to start thinking about it and time to start renewing and all of that. But it is a three-year accreditation. So 11B, that you have a policy and procedure that is implemented that defines the protocol for chemotherapy drugs where applicable. Uh, this is looking at uh, dosing, uh, BSA, dose calculations, uh, companion diagnostics, all these other things that are going into that. So that's 11B. 11C. The organization will inform patients of the cost of their medications and uh, provide information about financial assistance. Hey, Greg. Yes, sir. Another question. Does the survey work the same way for physician dispensing pharmacies? It does. Um, so the, the, the process and the expectation levels, uh, Ricky, and do ever ask the question is, is the same. Um, you know, so the, the survey day, the tools that we use for data collection, the questions that we would ask of the staff, the expectation level for clinical documentation, documentation of training, all of that is, is identical for our uh, physician dispensing practices. So uh, let's look at uh, 11D. The organization has an accounting system that can track all of its patients' medications and costs. Obviously, you do, but uh, that is something then that the surveyor is going to look at. Um, obviously looking at ways that you are being able to produce reports to payers that are going to ask to see those reports um, and uh, looking at that system. 11E, that there's policies established and implemented in regard to the monitoring of medications used uh, for uh, the most cost-effective means, uh, you know, looking for collaboration between physician and pharmacist, managing dispensing, uh, routinely reviewed patient records you know, at least every 30 days. So there's details in there as well that uh, are looking at our ability to, be, to find the most cost-effective means for providing uh, the, the drugs that we are. 11F, policies and procedures are established and implemented regarding the guidelines for personnel uh, and occupational safety related to exposure to hazardous materials. Uh, we'll be looking at specific training to your staff appropriate infection control procedures, specific regulations that might uh, be attached to dispensing of chemotherapy medications, safe methods for handling, 
medication error preventions, all those typical things for the surveyor will look for those while they are on site as well. And those will be things that they'll talk to your staff about during interview. Not only will they look for documentation and a personnel record for that training, they would then validate that training uh, through uh, interviewing your staff. H, policies and procedures are established and implemented regarding the handling and dispensing of oncology medications, that those policies include safe methods of handling, labeling, storage, transportation, dispensing, and that you follow any of the obviously local requirements in your area. Uh, I, policies and procedures are established and implemented uh, for the disposal of hazardous drugs and materials, uh, waste materials, looking at the safe methods for disposing of those materials and uh, validation that you're following whatever uh, local and state requirements would be there. J, the organization monitors the use of physician-ordered medications for chemotherapy uh, medication. Uh, looking at medication reconciliation, adverse reactions, um, REMS, uh, primary uh, diagnosis, documentation, all of those things are all listed there. It goes through a, uh, a lot of different things, looking at cycles, uh, allergies, physical history, uh, many different aspects to that one. A K is that there's policy and procedure established and implemented in regards to the education given to the client patients on the protocols for the use of their medications. Uh, we had another so, question. You had mentioned uh, earlier that CMS and other payers recognize ACHC accreditation. Do you have a list of payers and is it state specific? Um, I don't think that payers would be state, state specific. Uh, when we look at CMS, uh, of course, that is national. When we look at Medicaid, that would equally be national. And then payers, typically, you're either approved for a payer or you are not. I don't know that it's regional. I'm looking at uh, Lindsay right now to see if she has any insights. Uh, the only other thing I would add is we do have a regulatory department here that's constantly working on those types of issues. and. If one of our providers ever does experience an issue with a payer or knows of something that there's one we need to reach out to, we are constantly making efforts to do that to make sure that we have acceptance where our providers need us to. And, and Ricky, I'll check. I think it's a great question to ask about a, a list of payers. Um, I will find out what we have available for that and I will forward that to you so that you can send it on to the attendees of this uh, meeting, uh, you know, typically uh, acceptance by a payer for ACHC is, is not an issue, uh, but, but there are rare exceptions out there. And then as Lindsay said, we are more than happy to actually jump on airplanes and uh, go meet with these folks and help to advocate on behalf of uh, any of our providers. Great question. Yeah, there's another follow-up. Uh, is there a preferred software program to track patients uh, we do all these things, but do not have a good system to track it at all for the things that you're going through. Well, you know, and, uh, you know, fortunately with, with COPA, you have so many folks that have navigated this already. You know, I think of Josh Cox and, and Todd uh, Murphy and others, they would be tremendous resources, I think, for our attendees to, to connect with and to find out what they and their practices are doing. Uh, there is some fantastic software out there and uh, I don't know that there's any particular one that, that we would endorse, but uh, Ricky, you may have some thoughts on that as well. Yeah, um, the, the uh, we'll talk about it later and we will uh, go over it with the tools that we have at the end. Uh, so I'll push it off to then. Um, we did have another two people that commented, Florida Blue Cross Blue Shield does not recognize uh, physician dispensing pharmacies um, and they're asking about getting a network is that something that you can help with uh, in working with payers like them uh, with using the accreditation well, you know it, it and Ricky you could probably talk to some of the history of our two organizations together I mean ultimately it was concerns like that that uh, put our two organizations together and uh, you have done a, a excellent job advocating on behalf of, of physician dispensing practices 
and we are absolutely committed to doing everything that we can to assist uh, in any way that we can, and I know that COPA is as well. Yeah, and I, I will add to that that uh, for those that are having issues with the payer, uh, especially payers like Anthem, which are uh, on a national basis, one of our goals as we get practices becoming accredited is to, we, we are partnered with ACHC at going and sitting down at the table with payers uh, to look at ways uh, at, at them recognizing not just the specialty accreditation, but the oncology distinction that uh, Greg is talking about to help you in being able to be in network as a physician dispensing pharmacy or a retail pharmacy. Uh, we had another question come up in, and probably from a urology practice where uh, many are just physician dispensing pharmacies and uh, through everything that Greg is talking about, all of this applies to both retail pharmacies and physician clinics and physician dispensing pharmacies. A absolutely. And, and we, uh, with, with Ricky and with COPA, we, we are absolutely uh, committed to do anything that we can to uh, continue to move this forward. You know, this, this was a proactive move by COPA in looking at establishing a very high bar and a very high standard so that we could go and speak to payers to make sure that they know that these physician dispensing practices are able to be uh, subject themselves to a very rigorous process and to be able to validate the adherence to a very high set of standards. And, you know, it, it, it gives you a seat at the table and it gives you an opportunity to have a conversation. And that, that's ultimately, I know, what, uh, what we are trying to do. So, you know, we're just continuing to go through these real quick at a very high level. You know, most of the questions obviously are not around standards right now. They're more around process. So we'll go through this quickly and then we're, we're available for, for all those process questions as well. Um, 11K, of course, is looking at uh, education that was provided to the client uh, and the patients, obviously, about uh, medication uh, protocols. Um, L is looking at uh, the organization in regard to documentation of the communication of medication errors. Uh, M is looking at communication with other healthcare providers related to the provision of oncology medications, looking at you know, specific monitoring plans, therapy endpoints, investigational drugs, protocol management, and all those things as well. And then lastly, N, uh, each patient receiving chemotherapy must have uh, personnel available that perform uh, patient advocacy duties on behalf of them. Uh, so those are obviously only section 11, which is the distinction of oncology section. So just as a, as a reminder to circle back again, there is an expectation level that, that um, it is a requirement, not just an expectation level, there is a requirement that all of our practices would become both uh, specialty pharmacy accredited with the distinction in oncology. So although we only covered section 11, you would also have responsibility for section one through uh, seven as well. And we had another uh, question, Greg. Uh, what's the typical time frame on accreditation process from start to accreditation? Yeah, you know, it's it, it's so individualized. It's it's hard to give it. If if an organization committed tremendous amount of resources to it you could probably do it in 90 days to 120 days, but you'd have to put a lot of effort and energy into it. And, and, and take advantage of the help that is being offered to you, both through ACHC and through COPA. I would say typical for us is closer to the six month end of that spectrum. But have we seen people do it in 90 to 120 days? Absolutely, but they're putting, they're putting some real effort into it. So. Uh, and that might be actually a very good question. Uh, I don't know if you have any other questions there, but that would be a great question for us to ask our, our customer um, from BioPlus who's joined us on this as well. Uh, Dr. Morales and Dr. Uh, Grabeel and um, Claire uh, Hines, I know all of you are on the line and participated obviously in the successful completion of accreditation. How long did it take you guys and, and what, what was that process like? Maybe just share a little bit of your experiences with everybody that's on the line now. I did have another question, Greg, that, and I can answer part of this. Have any of the payers used this accreditation in order to include a practice which they had previously excluded? I, I do have one example of this I know for sure, and I'm not sure if you have any examples, but uh, 
Todd Murphy, one of our co-chairs on the COPA board, along with Josh uh, Cox up in Ohio. Todd is in Alabama. Both were the first two practices to get both the specialty accreditation and the oncology uh, distinction through ACHC. And in doing so, one of his pairs uh, in Alabama, the uh, uh, an Anthem provider required two forms of accreditation in order to be a part of that network. And uh, he was able to use both the ACHC specialty accreditation as one form and the ACHC oncology distinction as the, uh, the second accreditation, uh, which they accepted and allowed him to then uh, uh, continue uh, in network. So that happened immediately following uh, his when he when he got accredited after ACHC had been in and passed his clinic. So that was an immediate example of some a practice that did get it. Do you have any other examples that you know of? That was one I knew immediately. You know, obviously Todd's is the one that came to my mind as well, um, and his was unique because of the dual accreditation thing. But I am sure, uh, Ricky, that there have been others. Um, you know, but but just keeping it in perspective, the what you think it's, it hasn't been that long ago that, that you together with ACAC helped to develop these standards and we did our beta test it's probably only been six months ago that we did our beta uh, for these maybe a little longer than that but time flies when you're having fun but um, uh, there haven't been a lot that have come through to this point and then those that have properly executed that then taking it out to the marketplace to let payers know so we're we're still on the front end of this wave that we think is coming um, but, but, you know, we're, we're obviously here today hoping that uh, more folks that are going through this and more folks that are, are talking to the payers, uh, then the, uh, the wave is going to pick up some momentum. Yeah, and I, I was going to say something similar to that, Greg, that uh, this is important for all of you on the phone. Uh, because we just started this process and had the initial practices going through the accreditation last year, we have been waiting uh, to sit down with payers and others in this arena until practices started to get the accreditation. We didn't want to harm the practices that in the physician dispensing pharmacies that had not got the accreditation by going and sitting down and the payers being all excited about the accreditation and then immediately excluding everyone that did not have accreditation, which uh, for most of us, that's, uh, you know, 90% of the practice physician dispensing pharmacies right now. We know that many of you all are uh, working to get that uh, currently, which is why we're waiting for that uh, number to go up. And, and if there are pockets, like the example that was given in Florida, if there's a payer that uh, we can work with uh, in your state, then that can give us a, a place to start. Um, but we just haven't gone out globally and done anything because of the initial startup of practices becoming accredited. Hey, Dr. Morales, you have with you uh, Dr. Graybeal and also uh, Claire Hines as well? Correct. Thank you for joining us and for uh, hopefully sharing some of your experiences about the journey of, of getting accredited. A question came up, you may not have heard it, that they asked how long did this process take and then any other helpful information that you and your team would like to share. I'm sure that our attendees would love to hear that. Okay. Um, just so everybody knows, we, we are a uh, independent, um, especially pharmacy, meaning that we're not uh, related to a PBM in any way. And um, we started to see contracts that uh, attempted to uh, um, either exclude us or have this requirement, um, um, requiring a certification in different contracts with different uh, requirements and uh, so our company is targeted towards us keeping these plans of course um, and we, when we started this process we were looking to improve our oncology program and we took we made this uh, actually a quality improvement project for our pharmacy and it took us about a year to uh, go through this entire process we started at the beginning of last year and uh, began working through the standards uh, preparing, um, um, going through our policies, comparing the standards, making sure we have policies addressing everything. And then the next step was making sure that we had processes that addressed everything our policies said we, we, we uh, do. Um, 
So about a year is, is, is what it took us. I think one of the, the, the things that was most helpful was writing uh, an oncology program description policy. Um, that helped kind of encompass the whole thing for us and align everything for us because we had a lot of policies that addressed many things throughout the standards and that's okay. But for us, we needed to put uh, many things all together on the policy as well. And that's one thing that we're going to discuss after your slide. I, I will go over a lot of these policies and procedures that we have already developed for practices to be able to download and make their own. Uh, what was what was the most difficult part of the process that you went through? Yeah, probably um, the training of all of our teams, um, going through the standards, reviewing our policies, and identifying that we do those things, but then ensuring that our teams are doing that so that when a surveyor came in, we could prove that we are doing those things. And has it changed, has, with you getting the accreditation, has it changed uh, your relationship with any payers? Yes, this is Claire Hines, and, and um, absolutely, it, um, it's a good talking point when we're in making presentation with payers. Um, oncology, as you know, is pipeline is very rich, and and so payers are interested that you have special programs set up for oncology and that you take special care with their patients and how you're, you know, searching for doing special benefit investigations for those and looking for their cost containment and how your teams um, work together to make sure that the patient has the best outcome. Did it change any on any reimbursement from any payer? Out of curiosity. You know, not so far, but that is um, something that we've taken up and we're working backwards with that. Um, I think it's more helping us um, work towards ex ex exclusivity for some plans um, and trying to limit the number of um, suppliers that are available um, in the network or even be an exclusive provider. What, what would you say, you know, for all these people that are on the call today that have not gone through this accreditation, if, if you could teach them something that you wish you had been told, you know, prior to you going through the process that would have helped you, what would you share with everyone? Um, I think the things that we've learned from going through uh, our accreditation processes is that most people do most of the steps. However, they, they lack the documentation to prove that they've done the steps. Um, so it, it's really important to do them. We have meetings and things, but documenting who's in the meetings and then documenting that we roll them out all the way down um, from top to bottom, from the company top all the way to the company bottom, so everybody's aware of the new process that's in place. I think also, um I heard somebody's question about a software program and granted a software program to help you contain all this information would be great, but this can be done in your current uh, software program um, um, or outside of it maybe. I know we hate to go the paper process, but something has to go that route and you just have to identify the process and check it and make sure people are doing it. I appreciate I appreciate y'all getting on the call because it's very helpful to hear from a practice that uh, a pharmacy that's gone through this process. Thank you, Dr. Morales, uh, Claire, and uh, Dr. Grable. Was there anything else that you wanted to say uh, before I move on that you that you think you forgot? Okay, I will move on. So I appreciate you all getting on the call today. Um, I want to quickly go through some slides. We'll get back to the questions as I noted in a minute, but this is really important. On our website, uh, the pharmacist uh, within COPA developed a bunch of free tools that are available to anyone. They do not cost anything. If you actually go to uh, www.coapharmacy.org, this is the homepage for it, and there's a banner that comes across uh, that talks about ACHC accreditation and on the top bar there's a drop down for ACHC accreditation as well as some information under the members only section and when you click on that you come over to this screen that talks about both the specialty accreditation and the oncology uh, accreditation the oncology distinction 
and, uh, and it, it tells you a little bit more about it. And then if you click to look at the tools, it's going to ask you about membership. You will click uh, and fill out the information to be a member of COPA, which is free, which will then allow you to go to these two different options. And I showed you uh, uh, on the taskbar at the top under uh, the member section where there's the uh, ACHC specialty accreditation and then on the right side, the oncology accreditation, two screenshots. And you can see that there are a list of menu items on these screens uh, which talk about pricing and other things, the standards uh, that are noted as well as many tools which I will show you really quickly. Some of this will answer some of the questions that have already come to me. Um, both of the, those menu options will allow you to pull down the actual uh, uh, specialty accreditation and oncology uh, specialty accreditation standards, which this is page one of those standards on each of them so that you can actually read them ahead of time. It's very overwhelming when you first read them. It is a lot of information. We have tried to simplify it. The pharmacist uh, on the COPA board spent uh, all summer two years ago, uh, writing up policies and procedures to help practices meet these standards. Um, and this is an example. So on the screen itself, uh, uh, on, on the website, it lists on the left side, you can see a screenshot listing all the standards. And in this case, it's the oncology standards that are noted, the DRX 11-B, which I've highlighted. Uh, if I click on the Word document, you can see on the right-hand side uh, the actual policy and procedure that was written so that you can pull that uh, down in a Word document, modify it so that you, uh, you read it, modify it, make it your own, so that and make sure your practice follows those standards uh, so that you can do this for every single standard uh, so when you get audited, you pass uh, the accreditation. We also did some things after the audit uh, in yellow, the ACHC survey preparedness. Uh, this is what Todd Murphy did after he went through the audit. He wrote up a bunch of the things that he wished he had had prior to going through the audit that would have helped him. Uh, the patient record audit checklist giving a stand, the standards under uh, DRX2 and then giving you information that would help you in passing that standard. The personnel files audit that I've hi highlighted in green and it lists a bunch of information uh, that will help you in passing the personnel files sections of the DRX specialty standards. Then there are some potential interview questions that he got asked and Josh Cox got asked. Uh, when being audited that would have helped him had he known this ahead of time, as well as a plan of correction that's highlighted in blue here uh, that you can download and see what uh, Todd did in helping uh, his practice provide a plan of correction when the audit uh, was done. Um, there's a screen that's a, a joint partnership screen between ACHC and COPA. When you click on it, this is how you actually start the process of working through this. Uh, this tells ACHC that you're a COPA member and it will give you, as some people have asked, what is the pricing? The pricing to get a dual accreditation for the specialty and oncology accreditation is $15,000. But if you do it through our joint site and are a COPA member, which as I've noted previously, being a COPA member is free, uh, you get $3,000 off that. So your cost is $12,000 for three years or a total of $4,000 per year for the accreditation. Once you sign your, once you put your information into this uh, joint uh, screen between ACHC and COPA, uh, the uh, personnel at ACHC will assign it to a team member and within a day they will call you up uh, to follow up with questions to start the process if that's what you were looking to do on becoming accredited. So, um, so let me go back over with so the first question that we have is, will the oncology specialty accreditation change our distinction from retail to specialty? I'm a retail pharmacy fighting to avoid being identified as a specialty due to a variety of reason, reasons. Well, I'll answer part of that. Getting the specialty in oncology accreditation does not make you any kind of pharmacy. Uh, all that the accreditation does is provide accreditation to your pharmacy and meeting the standards noted under 
the pharmacy specialty accreditation and the oncology accreditation. So there's no relevance to getting the accreditation, changing what type of pharmacy you are. If you're an in-house uh, physician dispensing pharmacy, you're still going to be an in-house physician dispensing pharmacy with a uh, an accreditation, a specialty oncology accreditation, I mean, a, a specialty accreditation and an oncology accreditation. That's all that will do. Uh, Greg, do you have anything to add to that? No, I, I, I agree. I mean, and I'm sure that there are reasons why somebody wouldn't want to be um, designated as a particular type of pharmacy. We, when you do get accreditation, you are listed on our website. Uh, but I do not believe that our website specifically lists the services that you are accredited for. I'd have to look at that, but I believe that payers frequently will look up and see, you know, is Josh Cox's company accredited by us? And, and they'll, they'll go down the list. But I don't think that it tells, I think it tells pharmacy, but it doesn't tell any of the distinctions within that. So I think the way that we would present it to the world from our website, it would just say that you are accredited for pharmacy. Uh, and then I think you're dead on as far as uh, uh, the way that, you know, it's really up to the pharmacy to leverage that accreditation to mean or do what they need it to. And there, there are a lot of practices now getting accredited. And uh, as Greg had alluded to, and I did earlier, uh, we have people like uh, um, Todd and Josh and others who are willing to help you uh, through this process. So you can reach out to us and their information is actually on the website. You can find out what software programs they use. We do have, I did not have a slide, but this goes back to the question that was asked earlier. We do have all the software programs noted under the member section on the COPA website of uh, pharmacy software programs that, uh, that the practices within COPA are utilizing. So you can go under the member section and look at all the different types of software that are noted. And if you email me I, or, or email the listserv, you can even find out who is using specific software if you want more questions on those software programs. Um, I don't know if BioPlus is still on the phone, anybody from BioPlus, but someone asked what software they were using. So what, uh, what software are you using, someone asked. So we're using Mediware systems. Um, they have a software program called CPR Plus. However, we also have uh, done, um, uh, created some internal software ourselves to help us uh, with some of the documentation and processes that we have here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, someone asked the question, I've already signed up for specialty accreditation only. Is it more expensive to add the oncology distinction? Um, the cost, as I noted earlier, um, is 12, it's actually $12,000 for the specialty accreditation, $3,000 for the oncology distinction combined. That's where I got the 15,000. And then if you're a COPA member, you get $3,000 off to make it $12,000 for the three years for both accreditations. So if you have already received one accreditation, the specialty accreditation, you can sign up uh, and receive the oncology distinction, and you can still go through the process of doing that through the COPA website. Uh, we had another question that says, um, What's the average size of the pharmacies that become accredited? And what's the average staffing? So I guess I will ask, you know, BioPlus, how large are you all, just to get someone that's gone through this, and how many staff do you have in your pharmacy? Um, we're currently about 250 employees right now. Um, but we've been accredited for, since we were probably 50 employees. Um, I think one of the main things that it's important um, to do when you're going through accreditation is have a team so that it's not just um, just the pharmacy that's going through the process, it's the entire company. Um, we have a team that represents each division of our company that, that's represented on our team. And the other thing is we don't go through accreditation and just get accredited and then stop looking at that um, even after our accreditation process. Um, we keep a monthly accreditation meeting going 
that we revisit things and just do a check and make sure that we're still as tight as we were the day that we went through accreditation. Awesome. Thank you. So, so you all are an example of a large pharmacy, and I will say, and Greg, you can uh, chime in also, that um, this is for all size practices. So we have practices that are uh, one pharmacy tech or one pharmacist, depending on if they're a physician dispensing pharmacy or a retail pharmacy within a physician clinic, where there's only one person that's employed in that pharmacy uh, that's working to get accreditation. Greg, do you want to respond based on practices that you all have already been accrediting? Yeah, Ricky. Interesting enough, uh, when you look at us uh, program-wide in the pharmacy side, 50% uh, of our pharmacies would, would probably fall into the category of being very small. Um, now, a lot of those obviously are community retail and other things, but uh, we, we have 50% or above of our pharmacies tend to be smaller operations, smaller organizations, and uh, we'll have uh, limited uh, staff that would be directly involved in uh, the, the case of the specialty pharmacy uh, uh, operations. So all sizes. And think of the complexity from a from a policy and procedure standpoint. And I know, you know, when Todd and Josh and those help to write some of the policies that you have, uh, it is complicated to write a policy that is applicable to all sorts of organizations. And that's kind of that customization piece that each pharmacy, based on their practice and their personnel, would uh, take what is good written policy and bring it down to what their particular practice does and the you know, org chart that they have there to accomplish those things. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I figured. So for those on the phone, most of you all are smaller pharmacies. So uh, everything that we did within COPA two years ago in helping to create the oncology standards was, was centered around the fact that most of us have in-house physician dispensing pharmacies and most of us only have one or two employees. It might be the pharmacy tech working under the physician, acting as the pharmacist under state law, or a pharmacist themselves uh, running the pharmacy by themselves in that clinic. So uh, size is not what matters under here. And with Express Scripts requiring accreditation now, it's important that uh, uh, your practice start so that w if you haven't already got the credentialing pack package, you'll be prepared for it when it does come. We had another question that asked, how do I find out when we are due to be re-accredited re again? Do you reach out to them? I think you spoke about this earlier, Greg, but just to reiterate it. Yeah, yeah, and a good question. What, what my recommendation would be to anybody who is currently accredited with us, each Everybody that registers or is already credited has a customer central account and that customer central account has all of the information about their accreditation from what their renewal dates are, who their account advisor is, uh, demographics on their information, all of their receipts and everything. So the first place I would go is ACAC's customer central and if you don't know that number, you can just call and ask for your account advisor. They'll get you to that person and they'll get you hooked up. Um, the second piece of that, Ricky, as you said, is about 12 months out, we will start to send emails saying, get ready, it's coming. And we don't really start, we, we're, we're going to allow organizations to kind of internalize that however they do. We're not going to keep bugging you, but we are going to start sending those notices out about uh, 12 months out. And then about six months out, we're going to kind of pick that pace up quite a bit. Thank you. So we had another question. We're a physician dispensing pharmacy. Do we have to have a pharmacist in order to achieve accreditation? We currently have pharmacy techs and you might read them and feel like you have to have a pharmacist employed, but you do not. There is one provision we know in, our, in the standards and the oncology distinction where you have to have a pharmacist involved in an annual meeting um, uh, working with the practice to uh, in that meeting to oversee some things and Greg I will let you expound on that and anything else but you are not required to hire a pharmacist in order to get the accreditation. Correct if you're meeting state law in the dispensing of those drugs you uh, 
are doing good. Now, now we did not soften the standards and the requirements, Ricky, as you know, the, the requirements are the same, uh, but uh, we, you know, we have no problem with physician dispensing practices who do not have pharmacists. If they're meeting state law, they're going to do well. Um, and, and yes, we, um, you know, from, from, from our perspective, uh, you know, it, it really ultimately comes down to um, if you're meeting the state uh, law, state practices, wherever you see the word pharmacist that's in there, it's, it's used more, I don't want to say generically, but, but it, it's used as it relates to uh, your, your, your practice in that area. I know you had one other question, Ricky. What was that? No, that was that you answered okay. the question. So uh, I do have another question here. Um, but, but it is important. I want everybody to understand because I get asked a lot many times, uh, uh, you know, I can't pass these because I don't have a pharmacist. This, they will look at the physicians as the pharmacist. So you have to still, as Greg noted, the standards are still as rigid, whether you have a uh, retail pharmacy with a pharmacist involved or an in-house physician dispensing pharmacy with a physician acting as the pharmacist, the, the standards hold up the same way uh, when they come into them, but they're not looking, if the physician is acting as the pharmacist, then they are looking for that physician to uh, comply with the same way that the pharmacist would comply uh, with those standards. So that's an important point. Um, I got questions regarding, and, and I don't know if you can even answer this question, do you see overall lower reimbursement margins for specialty pharmacy versus retail pharmacy? I personally don't even have an answer to that question, um, but was curious if you had an answer to that, Greg. No, we really, you know, we hear things somewhat secondhand, uh, but, but no, I, I really, um, you know, we, we are constantly out there advocating on behalf of our credit organizations. We are meeting with payers, um, but generally it is not around the topic of reimbursement rates. It's more about uh, acceptance and more about, uh, you know, access and availability than it is uh, reimbursement. Okay, thanks. Um, is ACHC recognized by drug companies? I have some drug companies that do not want to sell certain meds to us because we are not accredited. Had not heard that before. Uh, well, that, that's a kind of a new one for us too. I, I, I would think, considering that there really are only two predominant specialty pharmacy accreditors, that any drug manufacturer that was going to use that as a benchmark would have to include um, URAC and ourselves. But I, um, we haven't we haven't seen that. We've seen that internationally in the accreditation that we're doing in other places. I will tell you that, but that would be the first that I've heard of it here. Okay. Uh, so, and I hadn't heard of that either. You, and you can email me and uh, get on. Uh, you know, call me up, um, and I'd be glad to talk to you about it because we had not heard about anything regarding drug companies requiring an accreditation. Uh, in order to be able to dispense a product. So I'd be really curious to know what, where that is happening so that we can reach out as an organization to that pharmaceutical company and find out what is going on. Uh, we had a, a question about uh, uh, two practices in Ohio and Alabama that were already in the network. So this goes back to the earlier discussion that I had about Todd Murphy's practice uh, where uh, Anthem required dual accreditation. Um, so, and I will answer this one. So, uh, Todd's practice was already a part of the network that came back and said, we are now going to require uh, two forms of accreditation when they passed, uh, which, which Anthem accepted both forms of the, both the specialty accreditation and the oncology distinction as two forms of accreditation. So I, I don't have an example of a practice that then tried to get into the same network uh, that was not previously in the network that used uh, both forms of accreditation, um, but, that, but they should, uh, I know like this Anthem plan should allow the accreditation because they're, they're accepting of both of them. And most payers 
uh, do view URAC accreditation and ACHC accreditation as uh, the two main accrediting bodies uh, with, uh, with ACHC having two accreditations that each of us uh, in our physician dispensing pharmacies can achieve uh, where URAC has the one. So uh, previously, many practices had to go and get URAC accreditation and ACHC accreditation in order to get the dual accreditation when they were required to have two. Um, now, uh, hopefully, with what happened with Todd, that will be the case for practices needing dual accreditation to be able to just use the accreditation with the ACHC. Um, do you have anything to add to that? Greg? No, and, 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 and Ricky, just to reiterate something I know that we both already said, I mean, if, if, if we can get on the phone with payers and to help them, to help educate them and understand how uh, challenging and how rigorous this process is for these pharmacies and these physician dispensing practices to go through, uh, let us do that for you. You know, you, you, you guys are not just spending money to get a certificate on the wall you are partnering with an organization that has a vested interest in making sure that payers recognize the, the, the challenge and the effort that you put into this and the high quality of, of care that comes as a result of this achievement. So let, let COPA, let us help you knock down some of those walls. We can't guarantee anything. And I know, Ricky, you would, you would, you would chime right in on that. We, we, th th this isn't a you get accredited and you're going to get access to everything. But but we have to add, we have to have something uh, to sell and uh, and 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 this is a, this is a great great thing for you to be able to take those payers. Yeah, and and I will say this because of the way that uh, uh, payments are transforming into quality payment models, uh, we need a way that we can. We know we do a good job in our clinic. We know we provide quality to our patients inside these pharmacies with the work that we do on, on behalf of our patients. Uh, but in order to get to a point where we can prove this, this is the first starting point at being able to show payers and drug manufacturers and uh, governments in our states that don't allow dispensing. Uh, uh, within physician clinics or they don't open up access to retail clinics within physician dispensing pharmacies. We need a way to be able to communicate to them, uh, a, uh, uh, being able to show them that we do provide quality and this is the way currently that pharmacies have been doing it way before physician clinics started to dispense through this accreditation process whether it was URAC or ACHC accreditation, uh, both organizations were, uh, you know, putting a stamp on uh, that, that pharmacy saying they do meet these standards, which are quality standards that these payers and PBMs were looking for uh, in providing good care to the patients that were having drugs dispensed from. So it's a key point. I've got uh, two more questions. Um, I believe that's all. Um, I had, so someone said I had, uh, and I don't know this drug, Cosentx, C-O-S-E-N-T-Y-X, tell me today, or that might be the manufacturer, today they would not let us in network without accreditation. I failed to ask which, uh, I failed to ask which accreditation they were looking for. I also had an MS drug company deny us because we were not URAC accredited. They were specifically looking for URAC accreditation. Uh, I've never, I haven't heard, we don't, I don't do in my own clinic MS drugs and I, I have never worked with this other company, this Cosentz. Uh, Greg, do you know anything on this? No, really the uh, first question that we got on this um was the first that I had heard of it. I mean, it, it doesn't sound out of the wheelhouse of some of the things that we have heard from drug manufacturers trying to limit their uh, distribution channels, but um, uh, th this would definitely be a first. But we we definitely will look up uh, this one, Co Cosent, I think you said was the first one. Yeah. Um, and see what we can discover. You do the same on your end, Ricky, and then we can always circle back with the uh, attendee that had asked that question and maybe see what we can do to give them some assistance. Yeah, that's great. Hello, this is BioPlus. Can you hear us? Yes, sir. Yes. 
Yeah, we have seen this. Um, uh, Cosentix being the one drug that um, we've seen this and a few other manufacturers um, that um, limit with URAC accreditation. I wonder why that is. Have you, but being a, in a uh, ACHC accredited practice uh, pharmacy, have you gone back to them and asked them why they don't accept that accreditation? Yeah, well, we do have both accreditations. So, um, but we have done that um, in years past when we only had one. Um, I believe we had ACHC first, and um, we had done that with some insurance plans. But just recently, this year was the first that we're seeing a manufacturer uh, do this. And I can um, I can send, I can get those details and send them to you after the meeting. That would be great. And Greg, that's yeah. definitely a good company to follow up because it doesn't make sense uh, why they would only accept one accreditation being a, ma a drug manufacturer. So well, clearly, and this is the, you know, the uh, obviously third participant today that has seen this. So this is something uh, relatively new. Uh, I, I will tell you candidly, we have not done a lot of work educating manufacturers we haven't really seen the need to. And uh, obviously that one has snuck up on us a little bit and we're gonna have to look at that. All right, great. Um, and then uh, we got a question, does specialty accreditation equal being able to fill more prescriptions? Uh, that's ultimately uh, the goal of, uh, you know, all of us going through this accreditation process is not just to meet the standards as required by some PBMs and payers, or now drug manufacturers, but uh, ultimately what we hope to do uh, by all of us going through this process is opening up the door to where, uh, uh, to insurance companies and others that currently don't allow us to dispense, to open those doors up because of our ability to show that we are just like other retail pharmacies in the area or other mail order pharmacies that uh, that companies and PBMs are pushing the drugs that we could be dispensing in our clinic out of our clinic. We're hoping to open those doors up and say, look, we meet the standards just like all of them. Not only do we meet them, but we've gone the extra steps on getting the oncology uh, distinction. And uh, hopefully that will be enough as we uh, negotiate uh, as more practices become accredited with uh, both accreditation, we'll be able to negotiate with payers uh, to open up the door to allow for more dispensing of drugs at the point of care with the patient. So that is the ultimate goal. Uh, any any comment on that, Greg, or was that good enough? No, that's, that's um, you know, we, we want all of these practices to have a seat at the table uh, to be able to validate that they have met every rigorous standard and requirement that is out there and frankly have voluntarily subjected themselves to that oversight. Uh, and once again, this is the only uh, uh, oncology specific accreditation out there. There is no other option. And these practices that have subjected themselves to this and have gone through that uh, have not only a lot to be proud of, they have a story to tell when they sit down with these payers. Uh, a follow-up on the uh, Kazentix drug or that I am not familiar with. Uh, Novartis is actually the manufacturer, and that's one that that's a company that we've worked with a, a lot over the years uh, in the oncology yeah. market. So, uh, so that's the company that we will have to circle back around with the manufacturer. So, with that, Greg, is there any last comments that you would like to make? Uh, I'm very appreciative that you got on the phone today and shared this with us. Well, Ricky, thank you to you, to your team, and obviously to our customers that were on there as well. And just the takeaway we hope you will get from this is this is not a battle that you have to fight alone, uh, that you have resources both uh, inside of COPA and here at ACHC to help you through this process. So uh, you don't have to walk this alone. Take advantage of these resources uh, and uh, we look forward to having everybody be a part of the ACHC accredited family. So thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, BioPlus, and thank you, Greg, and uh, your team at ACHC for putting this on for us today.